Well, good morning, Union. I'm glad that you're here hanging out with us today. We are in uh, week four of our series, I Feel Like a Nobody, and so we're going to jump right in today because we've got a, quite a bit to cover, and I want to make sure that we can spend time looking at the Scripture, but then also spend time talking about um, what it's really saying today. And I think that this message today has a, a chance to impact you in a very big way. And so last week I got the chance to preach live at Castle. so today, Castle, I'm back on the screen for you. Um, I hope that you can see that I'm skinnier in person than I am on the screen, but probably not. So anyway, it was awesome to be with you guys in Caswell last week, awesome to be preaching there live. I'm so excited about what God's doing um, in the Caswell County campus and what he plans to continue doing. What's awesome is you guys are only about six months old as a church um, <clears throat> as your own c campus, and uh, you're already a larger than we were at the Danville campus two years in. So um, you guys are doing a great job, and it's awesome to see people's lives being changed. It was awesome to meet a bunch of you. So let's jump into week um, four of I Feel Like a Nobody. Um, we have been kind of going with this series, the fact that everybody at some point in their lives has felt like a nobody. In other words, I'll give you some words. They, they, you felt small, um, you felt invisible, uh, you felt unimportant or worthless or useless or unseen or my favorite one that I've told you every week is not worth mentioning, right? So um, out of all those that I can identify with, I obviously identify with all of them, but not worth mentioning is one that pops up. The devil likes to use that against me and probably you too to say your life is just not worth mentioning. And so you end up feeling like a nobody going nowhere. And what we've said to you in this series is that um, that perspective is extremely skewed, and hopefully what you'll see through this series um, is that that is a skewed perspective that you have that you're a nobody going nowhere. That's not accurate. It's not correct. It, it, you're seeing it wrong and through a different filter, and so what we said in week one that kind of set the tone for this series is that you're seeing it um, through an earthly perspective instead of a heavenly perspective when you think that you are a nobody going nowhere, and hopefully what will happen is that um, through this series, we will take a look at these seemingly insignificant characters in the Bible. Like this is week four. This is our fourth one. So you should start to be seeing now that that perspective is skewed. We'll look at those seemingly insignificant characters and we'll, look at their, we'll, we'll see their significance. We'll, we'll pull out their significance. And I hope you've seen that in the last few weeks, especially last week with Lydia. I hope you saw the significance of her life. Um, even though she's a seemingly insignificant character that most people would not have even known existed in the Bible until last week. Um, and, and we're taking those people in the background and we're bringing them to the foreground. And we're taking those folks that don't get a lot of ink and we're giving them a lot of ink. Like they don't get a lot of ink in the Bible, but we're giving them a lot of ink. Out of all the characters that we'll look at um, through this series, and we've got one more week. Next week we have week five. Out of all those characters, this week's character um, is the one that has the most ink in the Bible. And that you may have heard reference in different pieces, but she still is... Uh, very much a nobody in the back of Scripture. And so what I want us to see, and it may take you this whole series to figure it out, is that you can learn a lot from a, let's air quote it, nobody. Because there's, there's not any nobodies in the kingdom of God. Everybody is somebody, and there's distinct purposes and gifts and talents given to, to those that are in Christ to be somebody in his kingdom. And even if it doesn't make it into this massive narrative, there are folks in the background that do work that is amazing and big impact in the, in the kingdom of God. And so I want you and I to see our lives like that, especially when we have those moments where we feel like a nobody. I want us to see ourselves as that's not true at all. There aren't any nobodies in the kingdom of God. And so um, <clears throat> we're going to start off with a story, and then here's where we're going to be in the Bible. We're going to be in um, two different gospels. We're going to be in John and Mark. So we're going to be in John 12 and Mark 14. If you want to turn there, I'll give you some time. You can turn there in your Bible. Or you can find it in the Bible app. Um, and as you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a story. So most of the time when I come home in the evenings, now I used to be really bad about coming home late all the time, um, but I've gotten better about that. And we have staff around here now, and, you know, and I'm older, and so I've made a lot of dumber mistakes in, in my past, and so now I'm trying to do things a little differently. And so when I come home in the evenings, um, usually what I come home to is this uh, running up to the door of whichever kid is the youngest at the time, and that kid comes and yells, Daddy's home, right? And so when it was Olivia, she ran up and said, Daddy's home. And then Aiden, when he was the baby, he ran up and said, Daddy's home. And now Madeline is our littlest one. She's the boss of our house. She's the hardest baby ever. If God would have given, given, given her to us first, that would have been it. When she runs up to the door, that's what she does now. She goes, Daddy's home, right? And it's so cool. It's so nice. Well, this one particular night, I get home, um, <clears throat> and, you know, 
it wasn't like that. There was a lot of stuff going on, and so I walk in. Nobody even notices that I'm there. And I smell this smell downstairs, and it's not dinner, all right, because I'd have smelled that outside. It's inside. It's not food, and I just smell this, this smell. It's just a, it just reeks. The whole house smells like some sort of Axe body spray, right, some sort of, some sort of body spray, some sort of perfume, cologne. And so um, I look at Valerie, and I'm like, what's that smell? And she just kind of points upstairs, um, which means that that's my daughter, you know, my oldest, Olivia, right? She's, she's the me of the family. And so I just kind of follow my nose all the way up the steps. And when I open her door on her, I don't knock because it's my house. I pay for it, so I don't be knocking on nobody's door. But anyway, I open it up, and as I open the door, she is spraying herself with this body spray stuff everywhere. I mean, she's just getting it all over the place. And, and, I, and I startled her, and she was like, well, Daddy, what are you doing? I was like, well, I, you know, well, you got there. Um, and she says, well, this is my body spray that our friend Grace, who goes to church here, so I call out Grace, too. Um, she must, Grace must stink just like Olivia does because she must need that spray. But anyway, and so she sprays, and she says, well, Grace gave it to me. And I said, baby, you didn't have to tell me what that was. I smelled you before I saw you. All right? I smelled you long before I saw you. I want you to just let that, let that weird image of my daughter spraying body spray all over herself and me, the fact of me smelling her before I saw her just sink in, and we'll come back to it at the end of the message. This is, this is how a ADD pastor preaches right here. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now, if you hadn't found John 12 and Mark 14, quit looking because you ain't never going to find it. You've had like five minutes. That's where we're going to be. Now, what we're going to do is, is to find this nobody, to look at this nobody, we're going to flip-flop back and forth between John 12 and Mark 14 because the story of this nobody is in three of the four Gospels. And for us to get a good picture of it, we kind of got to mix together a couple of them. And so we're going to mix together John's account, and we're going to mix together Mark's account to give us more of an accurate view of it. You know, because they both have different takes, different views, different perspectives of it. It's just like if you were at a party, and I was at a party, and you were on one side of the room, and I was on the other side of the room, and you recorded what happened, and I recorded what happened, it'd be very different, right? Mine would be recorded. I'd be telling you what every single kind of food we had, right? And if where there was Mountain Dew and how cold it was, and you might be talking about the people. I don't care about the people. I was paying attention to food. And so we're going to mix these two together as we go through. So you're going to have to flip Caswell, you with me? You're going to have to flip back and forth between John and Mark as we look at the story of this nobody. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You just got to kind of figure it out as we go. So John 12, verse 1 is where we'll start. Um, it says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. That's important. That's where our nobody's from, Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And so notice this says, six days before the Passover, Right? And he's back in Bethany, which is where Lazarus is. That's the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. That's his friend that he raised from the dead. And it's six days before Passover. So in other words, Jesus is on the way to the arrest and the crucifixion. And he makes a pit stop in Bethany, which is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. Right? There's like a pit stop there. Very soon before he's going to be arrested and crucified and, and murdered, right? Uh, it, before he's going to be dead, before he's going to be placed, you'll need to know this in a minute, placed into a tomb, um, he makes this pit stop in Bethany. Now, look at verse 2 before we go to Mark. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. So we got two players. We got Martha and we got Lazarus. Lazarus is reclining at the, reclining at the table. He's probably really happy not to be dead. And Martha is serving at this party. Now flip to Mark 14. You'll see the exact same story for the most part. The exact same narrative. Look at the first part of verse 3, right, as we just kind of go through the story. While he was in Bethany reclining in the table in the home of Simon the leper. So in Mark, we find out that we're actually in the house of Simon the leper. If he's in the house of Simon the leper... That means that he has obviously healed Simon the leper too because he wouldn't have been in the house with Simon the leper, nor would anybody else. Jesus might have showed up in the house with him, but nobody else would have been in the house with him because he'd have been unclean, right? So we're in the house of Simon the leper. Lazarus is there. Martha's there. It's almost like it's this party in Bethany of the people who Jesus has healed or had a big significant impact on their life. Remember, right before he's arrested and crucified. And so... Flip back to John and go to verse 3 and just read the first part of it. Then Mary, 
took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. So here we go. This whole series, every time we get to it, I tell you, here's our nobody. Here she is, this woman named Mary. Now, you may be thinking, oh, Mary, I know Mary, right? Mary's Jesus' mama. Nope, not the same Mary. Mary Magdalene, nope, not the same Mary. Matter of fact, there are six different Marys in the New Testament, in the Gospels. One in, um, five in the Gospels, one in, later on in, um, in the book of Acts. And so there are six different Marys. This Mary that we're talking about is Mary of Bethany. And so that's the Mary we're talking about today. So as you remember this story, as you think about this story, as you relate to her when we get to it in just a minute, think of Mary of Bethany. That's Lazarus's sister, the other sister, right? Not Martha, but Mary, Mary of Bethany. Now I want to tell you before we go any further, um, you will learn, <clears throat> I think, the greatest and most significant lesson of your life today from this nobody, if you'll pay attention. So I think, like, everything we've taught, don't get me wrong, I think it's been good. Um, I thought all the weeks have been good. This is one of those series I really like. It's very hard to pick who to talk about because there's so many. Um, but I think you'll learn one of the most important lessons of your life today and significant lesson of your life today if you'll pay attention and listen to the life of this nobody. And so if you've kind of checked out or you, maybe you don't like this flip-flopping around thing, just give me a few minutes because it's extremely significant what this basically just person on the fringes does and shows us how we are to live, especially in light of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Because remember, this is at a party where at least two of the people there are celebrating what Jesus has done for them. He's, he's, he's basically given both of them life back. One of them he's brought back physically to life. The other one he's brought back from a complete and total dead life of being a leper. And Mary, she, she just does something different to the extreme that shows you how we should interact with the Savior on a regular daily basis. And so that nard that she used, right, that we just talking about in the verse, very, very expensive perfume. Um, one year's worth of wages for this perfume. Not to mention the jar that it's in. So, so this, this jar of perfume, and you're probably thinking to yourself, who in the world would buy this? Well, you got to understand, this is like a family heirloom type thing, right? This is, this is that thing that, that somebody got at some point in time. And it has grown in value, right? And you only use it every now and then. So when the girl gets married, she might use a little dab or whatever it may be. You know, if, if it was left to Olivia in our house, it would have been used up that day. But anyway, um, this is one year's worth of wages. I mean, think about one year's worth of wages. Let's just take average median income. Let's just go $30,000 uh, for perfume, right? It's insane. It's really, really expensive. You could say that it costs a lot of scratch, right? A lot of scratch. You ever heard that term? Costs a lot of scratch. So I guess you could say this was very scratch and sniff kind of perfume. That's a good joke. I don't care who you are. You should laugh at that joke. It's a good scratch and sniff perfume. Anyway, let's keep going. Look at, uh, go back to Mark 14 and just look at the, the last part of verse 3. I call it 3C. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head to actually pour out the perfume. She had to break the jar. That's extremely important in what we're studying today. So I want you to take note of that, like, and which is one of the main reasons that I had us look at both of these accounts of the gospel. Because it's in Mark's gospel that you see her break the jar so she can pour it out, which makes sense because the way these jars were made, this is alabaster jar was made, and you know this if you ever had any perfume thing going on or whatever, if you're trying to pour it out of the perfume jar, it's like you got to shake it, it's barely coming out, right? And so she had to break the jar in order to pour it all out. That's really, really important. Now go back to John chapter 12, verse 3, the, the second part of verse 3. <clears throat> Where are we at? She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. All right, so she breaks the jar, she pours it on his head. Then you flip back to John and you see her pouring it on Jesus' feet too, and then wiping his feet with her hair. And this whole fragrance now has filled the whole house and probably outside the house and everywhere. L letting her hair down is a sign of intimacy in the Jewish culture, right? I mean, you think about it, it makes sense, right? Let your hair down, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and, and the Jewish folks, especially the Jewish men that were raised in this time period, 
all of them right here would have raised their eyebrows to her. Like, they'd have been like, what are you doing? You know, who is this woman? Why would she do this right now? But it's this, it's this sign of intimacy to her to let down her hair here. Um, and then she begins to wipe the perfume with, his, with, her, with her hair on his feet, right? So she's she got to get the picture. Got to get the picture. She breaks the jar. This is in the middle of dinner. She pours it on his head. She pours it on his feet. She gets rid of all of it out of there. She probably throws the jar aside. Then she begins to wipe his feet with her hair, right? And the whole house, you can just smell it now because the jar's been broken. Now go back to Mark 14 and look at verse 4 and 5. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. What are they saying here? They're saying, like, this is stupid. This is stupid. This nobody woman does not know what she's doing, right? She just wasted a bunch of money that we could have used to serve the poor, and she just poured it all over Jesus, and in the middle of the meal, and it's so out of place, and it's so weird, and, and she let her hair down, so she's breaking that law, and, and she's making us uncomfortable, and we don't like it, and, and we don't know why. She, she's just this nobody woman who does not know and does not really get it. But see, the, the difference is, is that she actually really does get it. And it may seem crazy to them, but to Jesus, it doesn't seem crazy at all. Look at verses 6 through 8. Stay in Mark 14, 6 through 8. Leave her alone, said Jesus. You remember a couple of weeks ago, I think it was Mother's Day, it may not have been, I don't know, when we talked about Jesus always being an advocate instead of an accuser? Do you see him right here yet again defending her, that he comes to the defense of those that are pursuing him? You see it right here. Leave her alone, he said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want to. Right? That's almost like a slap in the well, Look, you can do that anytime you want to do it. You, you say you want to help the poor, then help the poor. But you will not always have me. Watch verse 8. She did what she could do. She poured, per, per, poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Right? Got five, six days, depends on the account, until the arrest and the crucifixion and Jesus looks at her and says, no, 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 she did what she could. And there was a bigger purpose in her doing what she could than she would ever know, right? Bigger purpose of her doing what she could than she'd ever have any idea about. She had no idea, I don't think, that she was preparing his body for burial, that there was this bigger purpose, that it was a prophecy of Scripture fulfilled when she does this. She was just doing what she could with what she had, and yet there was a bigger purpose to it. And I want you to know that when you do what you can, when you will actually do what you can, there is always a bigger plan than you know. Like God always honors us doing what we can with what we have. And so when we do what we can, there's this much, much bigger purpose and plan that he's executing through us than we would ever have any idea about. And so when we think about us being a nobody, and we go, well, I don't really have anything, I don't really do anything. Well, no, what do you have and what can you do? And if you do that, God always has a bigger plan in place that you're going to have no clue about. You're going to have no idea about. Last week in Caswell, I talked about, I don't know if Duck did, but I talked about the fact that when we get to heaven, I think that we're going to see this family of God almost in like a hierarchical type of setting or in a genealogy or go with me, a family tree, where we begin to see that um, me and Valerie invested in these people, which then they follow Jesus, and these follow, people Jesus follow Jesus, and these people follow Jesus. And you see this random family of people that are now in the kingdom of God because of that. They're in my family tree now, right? And I think that when you do what you can do, you're never going to see it, but it's in God's plan, and he's got such bigger pieces for it. It's all about you not seeing what's going to happen with it. There's no way we would know if we were to get, help these people get saved, that then they'd help these people, then they'd help these people. We'll never see that on earth. We, we may never see it in heaven. I'm just guessing. But I'm telling you that when you do what you can with what you have, God has a much, much bigger plan involved with it. And so she here does what she can with what she has. And yet, there's this prophecy being fulfilled, and she's anointing his body for burial. You know, it's, it's really cool if you pay attention to it. Mary um, is operating in the economy of love. This is what I want you to get, because we're only going to come back to one more verse at the very end. 
Mary's operating from the economy of love. Judas, or the disciples, whichever ones, it depends on how you read it. The one that we just read in Mark, right, referenced that the disciples were the ones saying, no, we could have used that for money. If you go back to John, you'll see that it says, well, Judas was saying it, right? Because he was all about money and that kind of stuff. And um, <clears throat> Regardless, Mary was operating in the economy of love. Judas and the disciples, they were operating in the economy of common sense, right? It's a whole different ball game when you follow God operating in the economy of love versus the economy of common sense. See, the economy of love pours out. It pours out. The economy of common sense takes in. Do you see it in these verses? Do you see it? I mean, I hope you, I hope you see it because she knows the value of the perfume. What she says instead, though, is it's worth it. Right? She's well aware of the value of the perfume. Don't tell me that this woman doesn't know that it's a family heirloom and it's a year's worth of wages that's been around forever and it's the most valuable thing in her possession. She absolutely knows it. Tell me there ain't a woman in the world who doesn't know what the value of that perfume is she got in her house. She knows what it is, but she says it's worth it because she's operating in the economy of love, which pours out. And the economy of common sense, like they're doing, takes in. What did they want to do with it? They wanted to sell it, bring the money in, right? They give you some nice little churchy answer of helping the poor, but all churches say that about all things all the time. She says, I know what it's worth, and it's worth it to me to pour it out because she's operating in the economy of love. So she pours on his head and his feet, and it's everywhere. Do you see the picture of it? I mean, it's everywhere. Think about it. Some of you are like me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big guy, and I sweat like crazy all the time, but I can't stand to sweat. So I carry around like a rag with me every chance I get. I'm always wiping my forehead. I need one right now. You know, and I can't stand to sweat. And so this thing getting poured on me like this, I almost can read this and picture it happen and go, ugh, you know, like I just can't stand it. She pours it on his head, his feet, and it's everywhere. And then she takes her hair, and I want you to hear this because it's going to be important in a minute. She takes her hair and she deals with the excess with her hair. What's she doing with the hair? Because it's done got on the ground. It's flowing off, and she wants all of it. For Jesus. So she has to deal with the excess in her hair when she pours it out. See, isn't it funny? The one who focused on getting walked away with nothing. You see it? But the nobody who focused on giving bathed in the excess. I hope you see how good this is. The ones that, that were focused on getting walked away with nothing. But the ones that were focused on giving, the one, the nobody who was focused on giving, she bathed in the excess. The excess and the essence of Jesus is all over her. Hands, hair, no doubt dress, it's all over. The essence, the, the excess of Jesus. Everywhere she went, she took this with her. Like, I like the verse in here that says the whole house was filled with the fragrance. I had to leave that in there, right? In other words, go back to my story at the beginning. They smelled her even before they ever saw her, right? Because there's excess there that she's walking in. She's literally walking in the anointing of Jesus. Do you follow me? Literally walking in the anointing of Jesus. That's only found in her pouring out. You don't find her walking in the anointing of Jesus unless she pours out. And, and I'm here to tell you right now, you ain't going to find yourself walking in the anointing of Jesus either without pouring out, not taking in. It's economy of love, not the economy of common sense. This church has no economy of common sense. This church makes no sense common sense wise. None. But yet it works. Yet it works well, yet God has blessed it. Do I, do I dare say he's anointing it, it, right? Because I believe we're trying desperately to work in the economy of love, which pours out. Everything we get pours out. Everybody that needs it pours out. Everybody has something to pour out. And we bring it all to the feet of Jesus, and we give it all to him. And when I tell you that we have no plan B, you think I'm joking with you. There is no plan B. This is it. If it all falls apart tomorrow, we, we pick up the couple people who decide to stay with us. They'll probably be a Dickens in their last name, and we move on. That's it. 
That's just what we do. We start over again because there is no plan B. Look, here's the main point of today that I want you to get. You cannot access the excess until you pour out. You cannot access the excess. i got to say it very clearly because I'm country. Until you pour out. Everybody wants the excess from God, but you cannot access it until you pour out. You cannot access it by taking in. We will never experience the excess of God's anointing in this city and in this town and in this region, in Yanceville. We'll never experience it unless we are willing to pour out everything we've got right back at the feet of Jesus. We'll never experience it. And you will never experience the excess of what it is to be in Jesus and the excess of what God can do in your life and through your life without being able to, to pour out what he's given you, without doing what you can with what you have. Don't give me some crap of I'm doing what I can. Are you really doing what you can with what you have? You can't access the excess until you pour out. When was the last time you poured out? Say it differently. When was the last time you brought him your best? I won't pause. I'm going to give you an awkward, weird silence. This is funky on video, so here we go. I feel like I need to blink for something like Dora the Explorer. When was the last time you poured out? When was the last time that you brought him your best? Now, look, I'm not talking about your tithe. Don't worry. I'm not talking about your offering. I'm not, not talking about your serving time. Hey, look, I don't know if you know this, tithe, offering, servant time, those are bare minimum requirements of a Jesus follower. Bare minimum requirements of a follower of Jesus. That ain't pouring out. That's just putting your name on the test, right? Adam, did you just say that? Tithes, offerings, and servings, a bare minimum requirement? Absolutely for a Christ follower. There's, it's unequivocal. You, you can't look at it in any other way. I'm not talking about those. Those are bare minimum requirements. Let's say it this way. When was the last time you actually poured out sacrificially to Jesus? When's the last time you told him you can have it all? Everything. You can have everything. When's the last time you told him this home that you've given me is for you? You can have it. What does that mean, Adam? You give it away? Not necessarily, but maybe if he tells you to. I'm saying, it's your resource. You do what you want to with it. Who do you want me to have in it? What do you want me to do with this home to bless your name? This car that you give me, let me drive around every day. It is yours. What do you want me to do with it? When's the last time that you did that? If you feel like, you know, crap, here's another uh, one of those talks where, you know, one of those money talks from those preachers, then... Your relationship with Jesus is more like an undertow than an overflow, then, if that's the case. Because I don't mean that in this talk. I don't mean that in this message. And you don't have to take it that way. But if you feel like, oh, here we go, you know, another way to guilt trip me into serving, you're missing the point. It, 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 then you see your relationship as Jesus with this guilt trip mindset. You see it then as an undertow instead of the overflow. Like it's pulling you under, it's dragging you under instead of carrying you forward. When we, when we take in, we get nothing. But when we pour out, it's the overflow that pushes us forward. It's the extra, it's the excess. It's the anointing of God that pushes us further forward. You won't access the excess until you pour out. You won't do it. Well, Adam, I don't have anything to pour out. Sure you do. You absolutely do. You have a gazillion things to pour out. You have many, many things that could be poured out and said, God, this is all yours. And I ain't talking money. I'm talking all kinds of things. What if you said, God, these children that I'm raising, they are your children, not mine. They're yours. And I'm going to raise them to focus on you, and I'm going to push them towards their God-given gifts and talents instead of carting them off to every single volleyball game there ever was. I'm going to focus on their God-given talents and abilities. See, she had to break the jar to pour it out. You know, she's committed once she does that, you know? Like, once she, once she breaks that jar, she's committed. She's got to pour it all out. Sometimes I think you just have to take a step that makes you be committed so that you then have to pour it all out. 
That's what happens with us in the church. I'll be real honest with you. There's no part of me that really wants to pour it out all the time. What I'll have to do is put us, put our, put us in a weird position where I have no choice then but to pour it all out. It's kind of like breaking the jar. We moved into the YMCA. We had to break the jar. When we threw that out there, no clue what was going to happen. We had no choice but to pour it out. We didn't even think we could be able to pay the power bills. But we had to pour it all out. She had to make ourselves do it. She, she breaks the jar. And when she does that, she's committed. You know, let me just say it this way before we start to land. Initially, we follow God because we have a sin problem. Right? I mean, it's, it's okay. You can, you can admit it. And some of you, this is you today. Look, look. This is you today, and it's all right to be in this spot. Look, it is okay not to be okay, but it ain't okay to stay that way. It's all right. Some of you, this is where you are. Initially, we begin to follow God because we have a sin problem, and we need a payoff, right? We need it to be paid off. We need that debt removed from us. It's an albatross hanging around our neck, and we got to get rid of it. Some of you today, look, you're not Christ followers, and I'm sitting here telling you right now that you have a sin problem, and you need a payoff. And Jesus is more than welcome, willing to pay that off for you. But at some point, you got to quit following him for the payoff. At some point in the Christian's walk, it has to transition to not following him for the payoff anymore, that you're not following him from what you can get from him. You've got to move, on, move beyond, God, what can you give me? Instead, it's got to be, God, what can I give you? God, what can I bring to you? That's the way it works. And in the Christian walk, at some point, it's got to be not because there's this void of sin in my life and this sin problem and I need to pay off and I get something from him. Instead, it turns into when we really see him for who he is, and I don't care whether we're a nobody or a somebody, when we see him for who he is, we want to pour out everything we've got. What can I bring you? What can I give you? Because it's all yours. You've blessed me in ways that I cannot explain all the time, and now I want to pour out my life for the one who poured out his life for me. Nobody gets, I don't think anybody gets, Jesus' crucifixion more than Mary of Bethany does. Nobody's going to get his blood being completely poured out like the one who poured out everything she had on him that night. And then he says out loud that she's anointing me for my burial. And so when he's crucified, when he's murdered and his blood's poured out everywhere, and then he's thrown in the tomb. You can't tell me that she does not begin to really understand and get that he poured out for me. I poured out everything I had for him. I'm going to give him everything that I've got. The economy of love is not obligation. Let's go back to that economy of love thing. It pours out, right? The economy of common sense takes in. The economy of love is not obligation. Love never calculates. Love is never sitting around determining the proper amount, which, by the way, is almost always the least amount. That's how you know love doesn't calculate. Love doesn't calculate. Love gives all. Adam, you're telling me right now that if I'm sitting here today calculating what I'm giving God, then it's not love, it's common sense. Absolutely. Yes, it's exactly what I'm saying. You got the point, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I'm saying. If your faith walk is, what do I give God based on my schedule, my time, my money, my bills, then absolutely it's a faith of common sense, and you'll never bathe in the excess, ever. Instead, it's got to be, I, I give everything. Love gives all, absolutely everything. You know, this whole thing right here, this, this whole set of Scripture, the defining thing, the... what. What sets the tone here? It's all about the appraisal. Right? She appraised the value of Jesus to her. They appraised the value of the perfume. That's the difference. If you feel convicted by this message, that's the difference in your life. You're appraising the value of the things that you have, the stuff that you have, the people that you have, the reputation that you have, whatever it is. Instead of the appraisal being focused on the value of Jesus in your life. I want you to take just a minute right now and appraise the value of Jesus' love to you. Appraise it. 
determine its value. What's it worth? What's the value of Jesus' love for you worth? Can you put a price on it? It's a hard question. It'll make you think. This nobody is found three times in the gospel. Guess where she is every single time that she's found in the gospel? At the feet of Jesus. Every single time. Every time. She's found all three times. This nobody woman, this, this one that was fussed at by the disciples for pouring out this pure perfume and fussed at by her sister earlier and, and when Lazarus was, was healed. And, and This nobody woman is found three times and every single time she's at the feet of Jesus. Let me show you what Jesus says about her life. In the last verse we'll look at, Mark 14, 9. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. That doesn't sound like a nobody to me. This message, I don't know if I preach it right, or if you'll hear it right, or where your heart is today, but it has the potential to change your life. If you're here today and you're not a Christ follower, look, every message of the gospel has the potential to change your life. But if you're here and you are a Christ follower, there's an in-depth look that you've got to look at when you appraise the value of Jesus' love to you. What's it worth to you? Are you looking at him through this economy of common sense that's really more focused about taking in or is it an economy of love for you where it's I got to pour it all out and I don't know about you but I think I would look at this nobody's life and I would take it you know if I could trade spots or if I could do something I think I would take this story of my life. I think I would take that every single time I was found, I was at the feet of Jesus, and I gave him absolutely everything I had. And then he said to me, yep, when my story gets mentioned, when the gospel gets mentioned, you're going to get mentioned. Why? Because she pours out. She is in the excess, the anointing of Jesus because she pours out. No other reason. Look, I'm telling you, it's not anything else. It's not where you come from or what you look like. It's not the money that you have, it's not your education, it's not how you fit in the structure of the church, it's not the job that you have in the church or outside of the church, it's not your serving role, it's not your gifting, you don't have to preach or teach or anything like that, it's none of that stuff. It's in how you pour out what you've got. That's where it's at. That's how you walk in the anointing of Jesus. You pour out and you begin to access the excess and that's exactly what we see from her life. Look, her story, Mark 14, 9, you saw it, intertwined with Jesus' story forever. I want that. I want that nobody story. Is there anything else that should be said? Is there anything else that could be said except for her life is intertwined, Mary of Bethany's life is intertwined, intertwined with Jesus of Nazareth's life forever. You know, she sees his love as being so strong. There is this image. You, you see the, the birdcage on stage. There's just this image that I get of her understanding how strong Jesus' love is and the fact that he has set her free. He's freed her. And so when she appraises the price of him knocking that birdcage open and setting that songbird free, she has no choice but to pour everything out. So all I want you to do today as we close is I want you to focus on and appraise Jesus' love for you. And when you appraise that, when you get that, it will equal whatever it is you're pouring out. They go hand in hand. Let me pray with you. Father, we love you. We praise you today, God. I thank you for the fact that your love is so strong, God. I, I praise you right now for the life of Mary of Bethany and what it shows us here.
God, I would ask you right now to just touch people's hearts because I tell you, God, I desperately want to access the excess that is you. So I pray that you would just move in people's hearts here today. God, in both of our campuses, Lord, at every single church preaching the gospel, I, I pray that you would just move us in our hearts to appraise the value of you and your love for us. And that we would take the steps to break the jar so that we can't go back and pour everything out because you deserve it, because you're worth it. The value is not on God, what we have or who we are, the, the value is on you and who you are. Lord, I thank you for breaking my cage and setting me free, letting me fly free while you stepped into my spot and my place. I thank you that prophecy was fulfilled through her as she anointed you for burial and that her story is intertwined with your story. God, and I pray right now you would remove anything in our way, God, anything in our lives, Lord, that's keeping us from being intertwined with you. Show us what it is. Convict us of it, Holy Spirit, right now. Convict us that we may open our hearts up and move to you convincing us to do something about it. I don't know who needs this today or what you're doing in their lives, God, but I pray that you'd move right now, Father, right here, right now that we would move to a, a spot of not what we can get, but what can we give. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.